I don't think we decided. <laughs> there we go. It's on. This is Pastor Larson Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, asking you to join us here. As Jesus says, go ye therefore and make disciples. So you want to become a disciple of Jesus? If you're listening to this and watching it, you probably already are. What does the Bible say about discipleship? I'm inviting you to worship with us online or in person at Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, either at 8.30 or at 10.30. You can come in person at 400 North Swinton, or you can tune in at trinitydelray.org slash live, L-I-V-E. And I invite you to join our Bible study every Sunday morning or 10 or any time later. The easiest <clears throat> way I know is to go to YouTube and put in Trinity Del Rey and then search for Pastor Larson's Bible study. That works for me. I hope it will work for you. Now let's go to our question. What does the Bible say? <laughs> what does the Bible say would be the beginning of almost everything we do here. What does the Bible say about becoming disciples of Jesus? So here it is, unlocking a word that can help us survive the culture shocks that we, go, we all go through many times in our lives. We change and the culture changes and we are part of the changing culture. We both affect and are affected by our surroundings. I suppose even if you were a hermit or whatever the feminine ending for hermit is, hermitess, <laughs> you might wonder, well, this is really not the motivation for becoming a disciple, but it's a catch, it's a hook. And I intentionally went that way a few weeks ago when we started the study of discipleship to realize that the culture has changed and we didn't change along with it, many mm -hmm. of us. And we are- Thank goodness. <laughs> yes, Chris, thank you. Um, so the word discipleship comes from the word disciple, and the word disciple comes from a word that has to do with learning or a learner, someone who is learning from someone and following them and maybe even becoming obedient to them. You might say a disciple is an apprentice, an apprentice of Jesus. This is a quote that is left over from a couple of weeks ago from Eugene Peterson. He says, if we are disciples, we, quote, spend our lives apprenticed to our master, Jesus Christ, in a growing learning relationship. And I would add that that relationship ebbs and flows it grows and fades. It is taught and it forgets. Our apprenticeship requires renewal and uh, review and reminders. Uh, the Lord knows how we are. He remembers our frame. He knows that we are dust. Psalm 103. So he's patient with us. And if he were not, we would all be long gone. If we are disciples, there's part of us that say, it's, I'm not finished. And we love the t-shirt that the little one had on one day. It said, be patient with me. God is not finished with me yet. <laughs> I think we could all have that on our foreheads. What does it mean? Well, as we talked about last time, to be discipled, it sounds rather passive, I'll correct that in a minute. To be discipled means to direct one's mind to something. To accustom oneself to something. To experience. To learn to know. Not just to learn. And to understand. You get those? You put your mind to something. You want to learn to find yourself 
in an environment where you can be taught either by a book or by an experience or by someone that you know uh, by tuning in to a broadcast of some kind. There are many ways in which you become discipled. You learn under the instruction of someone or something. And it might be good and it might be bad. You could be discipled into, God forbid, something that's wrong or evil. We don't want that. So as we said, that becoming a disciple, it means following Jesus. That's the biblical idea. And the end is salvation. But there's a lot more of life between now and the day we enter heaven. We are saved by grace through faith. Following Jesus does not mean just to gain information. You know, we could have that little quiz at the end of every time we get together. And I don't like to embarrass people. So teaching adults, I might like to stump you in an introductory question that opens your minds. It's one of my favorite techniques of the joys of teaching. But we're not here just to know. We're here to know someone and to have faith in that someone. Faith is a big thing we could talk about someday. And to obey him. And today, in this session, we're going to talk a little bit more about that obedience thing. Ever since I started studying discipleship a few months ago, I was amazed and actually to be uh, self-revealing. I was a little annoyed to find out if I'm to be a disciple of Jesus, I've got to talk more about my lack of obedience to him. I mean, it bothered me in, in the law shows us our sins sort of way. So the purpose of this discipleship, becoming a disciple of Jesus, is for all of us at all ages in all manner of life experiences to have faith in him and to do what he says. Faith and obedience. And we're going to talk about that word obedience in a little bit. Becoming a discipleship, a disciple of Jesus means following with total commitment in an exclusive relationship. You're not following other religious leaders. Certainly not me or Pastor Vince. You're not following someone on TV that you love to watch or a book that you've become involved in. And except to the extent it teaches what Jesus speech teaches. You're following with total commitment in an exclusive relationship to one recognized not just as a teacher. They called him rabbi. Yeah. But as Messiah. You want to comment on, on this idea of uh, total commitment. You think you have total commitment? I think I think it's hard for us to be we try totally committed, but we try. Yeah. I mean the devil comes in and you know has his way every once in a while. Yeah, don't uh, caution, caution flag. Don't blame him for everything that you do wrong. He can submit no that he can't make you. The devil did not make you do that. What about your flesh? The, yeah. old, the old Adam and, mm. uh, and the old Eve, can I say that, that hangs around you every day and says, why don't you enjoy yourself? It's a simple pleasure. Well, he does want us to have joy though. Oh yes, but not in, not in uh, evil works, not in, oh, yeah, yeah right. of course not. So we're following him with total commitment. You know, this word total, I talked about this a couple of times ago, that um, there's a lot of people who have this idea. Well, as long as I'm doing 30 or 40%, I'm doing pretty good. 
better than most people. Uh -uh. My commitment to Jesus is about 30 or 40 percent on a good day, and I'm satisfied with that. Um, and there's an expression, I'm doing the best I can. Maybe you are, but I'm not the judge. The judge is standing at the door. <laughs> I shouldn't chuckle at that. He is. That's serious. But we strive for total. We don't make it. And we say, but I'm saved by grace. And if it weren't for grace, then, of course, I wouldn't have enough to get into heaven. But he satisfies and completes and so I don't have to worry about doing, uh, you see, we're caught between the minimalism of just doing enough to get by and the maximum, which is impossible for sinners. So the word total there may be a little bit, well, you can argue with me on that. With all the commitment that the Holy Spirit enables us to do, that's a trial sentence don't write it down yet <laughs> you see i'm still learning and i'm still learning how to teach you can help me to become a disciple of jesus means to follow jesus it could also involve suffering ah this is a little bit annoying paul had to suffer didn't he he wrote about his suffering. Would someone read Romans? Uh, by the way, Judy had another commitment, and she usually reads uh, first. <laughs> That's right. a, but I want another reader, please, uh, for Romans 8, 16 to 18. I can do it. Please. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, providing we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing the glory that is to be revealed to us. Romans 8, 16 through 18. That's a powerful paragraph, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we have something given to us here at the beginning, and that is the Holy Spirit. And he's in the business of internally testifying to our hearts and our minds that we are children of God. He's bearing witness. He's telling us, reminding us, I'm a child of God. I didn't say that. He did. Well, if we're children, then we are going to inherit what he wants us to have now and forever. And we're heirs of God. And we're fellow heirs with Christ. Wow. I'm going to take in all that that means. Provided. <laughs> I didn't know there was a proviso. See, this is all grace here. This is all grace. Now we have a requirement. No, not a requirement. Because the, uh, the martyr does not seek suffering. It comes. <laughs> it comes. Now, the, the suffering that Paul talks about is not the suffering of uh, sciatica or uh, some other ailment that bears you down. Suffering with Jesus is suffering, and this is difficult, because we are followers of Jesus. And that may become more evident as the world is changing our part of the world is changing. So in order that we may be glorified with him. So that's the end that comes at the end of suffering. Not all disciples suffer to the same degree. We suffer small losses by following Jesus. Certain pleasures that our flesh or the devil of the world tempt us to do Mm -hmm. we don't get to do. When all the other kids were going out behind the barn or wherever to have a smoke, we didn't go. <laughs> or did you? And you, 
you knew that you shouldn't because at least your parents said don't and you didn't know the health. No, we did not know before the 1960s that all the coughing and emphysema was coming and the cancer from, in part from that. And so smoking seemed like you get to do when you're an adult, but some kids said, I want to enjoy it now. My parents enjoy it so much. With all the coughing, they still have to have their cigarette. I don't want to go into detail, I already did, but that was the thing for me. I did not smoke. And the other two boys that went out in the field with the, their dad's cigars, uh, one got very sick. <laughs> I don't think he ever smoked a cigar again. <laughs> and the other just had big eyes, you know, like, I didn't know this was so strong. And I said, nope, my dad smokes enough. But look at verse 18 with me. Paul says, I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing. Now, and that word comparing means to put two things in a balance scale. And if I see the glory that's going to be revealed to us, that is so much more weightier than anything that I might have to suffer now. It's not even worth comparing. It's 400 megaturn, mega, megaton, tons. Can't talk this morning. Sorry. The, the glory that's going to be revealed to us might be like 400 megatons on one side of the scale and a tenth of a gram on the other. Not, not worth comparing. It's like a number 10 needle that you don't even feel in your arm as you go to get that required and desired shot for COVID-19. Mm. And you might have to have a little suffering with that too. That's what becoming a disciple means. Another reader for Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus says. Okay, I'll do it. Take my yoke upon you and learn, become a disciple from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Thank you, Chris. What promise does Jesus give us here? Rest. Rest. Um, he has a yoke. And the yoke is the yoke of faith and obedience. The previous sentence in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. <clears throat> for your souls. Rest for your souls. Thank you. So he's not talking about carrying a heavy load across the backyard. He's not talking about house cleaning or getting ready to tent for termites. <laughs> That's nothing. <laughs> but take Jesus' yoke, the yoke of faith and obedience, and become a disciple. The word learn here is a translation of a verb meaning become, be, be discipled. Jesus is gentle. He's lowly. He's humble. He's someone worth copying. And when you do this, you get an extra benefit, as you said, the promise of rest for your souls. The burden that you're carrying is the burden of sin and the guilt and the shame that follow from your sin. That's the that's what you want to find rest for. Not a good night's sleep. He's not talking about that kind of rest. There's an eternal rest. But there's a present rest when you realize and believe my sins are forgiven. My God has loved me that, that much. That much. 
this past week, my personal reading in the book of Psalms. Yes, mm -hmm. we came across Psalm 103. And I spent two or three days just on that one. Bless the Lord, all my soul. So that's the promise. To become a disciple of Jesus, what we're trying to do here, according to John 8, 31. D, you haven't read, have you? No. Go ahead. Okay. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. John 8, 31. Well, thank you. That's what he said to the Jews who had faith, who had believed in him. Now he wants them to continue to be discipled, and he said, what, what does that mean? What does it mean to abide in Jesus' word? What does that word abide mean? I'll give you a better translation. Live in his word? Live, yeah. Um, the, the, it's a word to remain. It's the opposite of leaving. If I remain in his word, well, right. that's, that's 66 books. That's 1,189 chapters. Wow. A that's chapter a, a day, it takes you three years to get through that. Don't take that as a burden. <laughs> Reading the scriptures is like taking little bites every day. Uh, abiding in Jesus' word. That's what it means to be a disciple. Abide, remain, stay. Don't leave. The world has a lot of teachings which are contrary to his word. The culture would tempt you and even order you, ouch, I will not, to follow other teachers who teach contrary to Jesus' word. And how are you going to ever know the difference between the world's message and God's message if you never read God's message? I don't think I have to convince you, but I do want to remind you that becoming a disciple means John 11.35. Who hasn't read yet now? By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. John 13, 35. Okay, love. Now, we could spend a couple, three, four weeks on this, but we're not mm -hmm. going to. Give some examples of disciples showing love for one another. Just use a verb. Helping. Helping. Absolutely. Comforting. Ah, um, yeah. How about teaching? Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, that would be, I mean, parents and, do that all the time. Yes. And grandparents and people across the back fence. And aunts and uncles, and yeah, everybody, yeah. I often tell parents that sometimes your children going into the teen years will accept, they'll, ex they'll accept teaching from everyone but you at this point. <laughs> That's usual. Significant Christian adults in a child's family. Yes. Showing love, having patience, exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit to people who need that kindness, gentleness, self control. Oh, that's hard. To become a disciple means, well, let's sum it all up. We're not done yet, but this is a stopping point to consider the points that we're making. 
it means receiving and knowing and believing what is taught. It has to do with content. And I'd just love to talk to you more sometime about the content of what is taught and obeying the Lord. You can't know what it means to obey unless you know what it is that you're supposed to obey. And you, you can't know what it means to obey unless you're abiding in his word. But none of that will make any difference if you don't have faith. Obedience is the fruit of the, of the tree, and the tree is faith. And I know your lives are filled with obediences that show that the fruit is real and that your fruit remains. Do you know, you and your attorney can come up with your inheritance and write it all down, the things and uh, value monetarily that you're going to give away because you don't have a choice can't take it with you so you're going to write that all down and say it all goes to those people to him or to her or divide it up in this way you do do that and you should but what about the rest of your heritage what can you pass on to the people who remain after you are gone. Memories? Yeah, there's a... <clears throat> Go ahead. That's a big question. Yeah. What can you pass on? <clears throat> How can you pass on your faith, your example? Integrity? Oh, that's a word I'd like to study with you. Mm. Maybe we'll do that soon. That's a deep subject. Your example. Here's a sobering thought. Two or three, and certainly four generations later, very few people on this earth will remember you. True. That's a sobering thought. How many of you remember your great grandparents? Most of us didn't even know them. You heard about them, but you didn't know them. And you realize how quickly the flower fades. And very quick. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And, uh, you know, on this earth, we're not permanent. That granite stone will put your name on there in two dates. And uh, they'll be there for a while. Hmm. But the, cemetery, the cemeteries or whatever they were of the fourth century BC, well, you can't find many of those. We have the heritage of people who wrote going back centuries, millennia, but we don't know them. How can you know, for example, Moses? Well, you can read the five books of the Old Testament that he wrote. So you know something about him, but you never met him. You understand what I'm saying to you? Mm -hmm. So this heritage that you pass on is the example you set. Let me put it this way. Though I did not know my great grandparents, I knew my grandmother that I lived with for three years. And we had very little conversation, I'm very sorry to say. But she did teach me a few things and irked me by saying things that just annoyed me and I guess spurred me to action. But in a way, she was passing on the heritage of her faith that she received from her grandparents or her parents. So your heritage does go on, but in a way that's not recorded by anyone in history. 
unless I wrote a biography or an autobiography. So your fruit of the faith that you pass on, your heritage is more important than you think about it. Probably. The content that you pass on when you teach my word and by example is nothing less than the revelation that God has given us in the scriptures. So we're talking here about the discipleship of what the Bible teaches. Not these earthly examples that I've been giving, which, however, hopefully are based on the Bible. Well, that's a long tangent. To become a disciple means, therefore, receiving and knowing and believing, trusting, and obeying. In other words, faith and obedience. And we're going to talk about this obeying in a few minutes, about the connection between faith and works. Okay? okay? Faith and works. It's coming. We have to do it. <laughs> if we don't do it, then you go back to your day thinking only about the obedience part and wondering what's the connection. To become a disciple means to learn. What did Paul say when he wrote to a young pastor named Timothy? I'll take a reader. I'll read it. Um, <clears throat> but as for you, continue in what you have learned, in what you have become discipled, and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. 2 Timothy 3, 14. Well, many had followed uh, myths and stories and were uh, things that were contrary to the word. But as for you, he says to Timothy, I want you to continue. That's the same idea as abide in God's word. Continue in what you have learned. The word learned here is a translation of the word that means to become discipled. It's passive. He learned it. And he learned it from Paul and from his grandmother and his mother. They were his teachers, Paul and his mother and grandmother. They had a heritage that they passed on to him in a very real way. Catechism began in the home. Paul called Timothy his son in the faith, but he wasn't his son. To become a disciple means to learn obedience. Titus 3.14, who will read it? I'll read. And let our people learn, become disciples, to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. Titus 3.14. Let our people learn. Again, we've got to work at the translation. The word in the Greek means to become discipled. And the result of that being that learning will be they're going to act with works of love. Good works, the Bible calls them. So as to help. I have a neighbor who learns of Someone who needs help, he learned it from me that I needed help. I didn't have a ladder tall enough that I could handle. And he went up on the roof and did some work for me. It was kind of urgent need. I got to get down before they put the tent up or it'll break. So he did it. And in his retirement, he said, I can't keep up with all the work that I find that people need me for. Oh, what a joy it is for him to have, have purpose in his retirement. Mm -hmm. What a joy to have him as a neighbor, not 
not to help me all the time. He really hasn't done that many things. He done, he's done quite a few big things I couldn't do. He's a retired electrician. Well, he enjoys works That's a lot. good neighbor. He is a great neighbor. And he has me praying for his sister, Rabani, and for her husband. And they're going through a long struggle I won't get into. She's been very ill. Mm -hmm. And there's some unexpected recovery coming for which we give thanks. So I get a text message from him now and then. Pray for Bonnie. And I said, we did. And the next day, yesterday, he gave me a praise report. <laughs> what a wonderful relationship to have. Hmm. Go over the back fence. And uh, his name is Forrest. You don't know him. But I've known him for 32 years. I was there at their wedding. Mm. I didn't do it. It was a, another church. But it was a beautiful relationship. And th th this, is, this is an unexpected blessing to have a Christian neighbor. Well... I thought that witness was worth that tangent. I hope you thought so. Not be unfruitful. Why would you want to be a tree that's alive without bearing fruit? Or a tomato plant without tomatoes? <laughs> to become a disciple means to learn obedience. Obedience. You're not children anymore. What is the connection between faith and obedience? That's the big question of the day, people. Help me make a connection. Because we have faith, we obey what God wants us to do. Because if we didn't believe in him, we certainly wouldn't obey him. That's the connection. I, I think um, faith is an inward thing and obedience is an outward thing. I don't know if that connects to. You're mostly correct, Chris. There is an obedience that's internal oh, in, yeah. our, in our thoughts and to some extent our feelings. Yeah. Although most of you were brought up saying you can't control your feelings. I won't go into that, but... I have worked on that, and you have too. So the obedience of faith is the obedience that flows from faith. Someone else? What's the if obedience means doing what the law requires, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, works. So we could rephrase the question, what is the connection between faith and works? And you've already said, didn't you? Faith and works. To become a disciple means I am saved by works. Or faith and works, or faith alone? Faith alone. Where did you learn faith that? Alone. Where did you learn that faith alone thing? <laughs> That's part of our Lutheran heritage, I think. Ah, heritage again. <laughs> yes, it is, and it's, a, and it's a rote phrase. But you know what? Once in a while, we have to dig in and see where it came from. I know where it came from, and I think you do. Anybody want to quote a Bible verse now? Oh, I can't think of where. You will. One of my jobs and joy is to remind and to bring it up again so our hearts may rest there. The world teaches if God's going to accept me, he has to accept me doing the best I can. And there is no Jesus, no Christ in that. 
except possibly as an example or teacher. There's no shed blood when a person says, I will be received into heaven or the afterlife because I've done the best I could. I know there are parents who have said to their children, do the best you can and I'll be satisfied. That's true. How many times? I hear that. Well, there is another group of Christians who insist that we are saved by faith and works. I'm not going into comparative religion studies today. I'm just saying that, okay? So we are saved by, and here's the passage that Joanne was trying to think of. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll, ask, I'll ask Joanne to read it then, okay? For, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing it is the gift of god not a result of works so that no one may boast ephesians 2 8 through 9 you want to uh, say a few words about that i think through our faith we we do good works because that's what we're taught that's what we want to do because we want to please, not please God, but because of what he's given us, we want to give others. So it kind of, through our faith, our works reflect our faith, but it's through our faith that we're saved, not by what we do. We can never do enough to save ourselves. That's correct. You people are well taught. I think sometimes <laughs> when I teach you, you taught it. I'm drawing out from you things that go back to when you were 12, 13 years old in catechism class. Mm -hmm. But I'm so aware, as I said uh, last week or the week before, that there are many who have not been uh, trained in the faith at the child catechism level. <laughs> And one of the things I like to do is to fill in the blanks there. But this is a basic passage, and no matter where and how you were discipled, trained, especially in the Lutheran Church, you learned Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Uh, maybe you learned it by heart. Hmm. Okay, it's not of works. It's a gift of God. So I can't boast about the things I've done. <laughs> Thank you. in the grace of God so no one can boast about it no I think works. there's a bit, of, a bit of hard wiring in the brain to be uh, do works um, you think of a nurse who, who, who day after day or people who do it right. I, I don't know you can expound on that people who are doing works of mercy and care and love certainly are doing works of God and no one knows that these are a result of that nurse's faith. Yes. Mm. But God knows. Now you used the word about pleasing God, Joanne, and I wanted to pick up on that because as you say, they. I know that I cannot please God because his, his requirements are so far above. But you see, I want to tell you something. You already please God. Mm -hmm. You please him because your faith is connected to his son his, and his son's work and word. Mm -hmm. And you know him by faith. And when God says to Jesus at his baptism, thou art my son in whom, whom I am well pleased. We in our baptism are well pleased by God, connected to Jesus through that baptism. It's a mysterious thing. It's not experiential. It's not something I feel, but I know 
according to the promises of God and his word. And that's when the grace of God was bestowed upon most of us at our baptisms before we had any awareness, physically speaking, mentally speaking, psychologically speaking. But according to his word, he saved us. That's in Titus chapter 3. And in Titus chapter 2, you can read that later. Well, I want to move on to the works thing before we run out of time. Because we have to make a connection between faith and works. And here it is. We have to add verse 10. We add verse 10, not in order to include works in our salvation, because works are forever and always excluded from the article of faith, which is called redemption or justification or salvation. Those big Bible words. Okay. A simple way of saying it is works are excluded from salvation. For by grace are we saved through faith. Now look at this. In white, you see the works, the, the faith passage that we just talked about. But now in, in gold or yellow on your screen, I've added verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Do you realize that? You're God's workmanship. He, he built you. He made you. He has formed you and he's fashioned you by his word. He has given you faith in Jesus. You are created in Christ Jesus, Paul says. For what? For good works. To do, to do good works. Yeah. And these are works that God prepared beforehand. Where did he prepare um, them? Pastor, that kind of uh, goes along with what I said, we're hardwired for it. Yeah, I, I didn't criticize your hardwired idea because I know. <laughs> I, I know that how often that hardwire fails and I need yeah. what, the, what the computers call a, a reboot. <laughs> <laughs> reboot, yeah. I need to download a, a, a new version. <laughs> I need to be connected with his word again. So there are people who fall away from the faith. Well, not completely. They just stop. They, they stop. They strangle their connection with God. And then uh, something happens in their life and they come back. And it's a wonderful thing. And they repent from their staying away. And the hardwiring needs uh, to be rewired, to be worked again, according to God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for the good works that they had forgotten about and they were serving themselves instead of others. I was getting on with this uh, prepared beforehand. Where did God prepare those good works before we ever came on the scene? Hmm. For by grace you have been saved through faith yeah the good it works. is a gift of god yes and, not and, a result of works so that no one may boast but for we are his workmanship created in christ jesus for good works which god prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Thank you, Pastor. He prepared yeah. them in, in, in his word, in his law, the word of God that requires obedience according to his law. He prepared those. And the whole purpose of laying those works down was that we should live and walk and be in those things daily. And we are at the end of your day, I hope you don't try to keep score. Well, I was oh. about 8.3 today. And, and I walked in, in them. Yes. We should walk, walk in them. The word walk means to live. Yeah. Okay. Pastor, I'll bet you have, you have preached on that text a dozen or 15, 20 times. 
<laughs> Maybe more. Maybe more. Maybe more, and especially on Reformation Sunday. <laughs> What's coming up this Sunday? Well, not quite. No, we're quite a ways from that. To become a disciple means we are saved by grace through faith alone. But this is what I wanted to underline. I forgot to underline it, but faith is never alone. Yeah, that's true. What does yeah. a live tree produce? Fruit. Yeah. Fruit. If it doesn't, we cut it down. Why encumbereth it the ground? He said of the fig tree. <laughs> We have a, I'll use another personal example. We have a hibiscus a bush that is <laughs> struggling. It, it, needs, First struggling. it needs to be fed. It needs feeding, okay. Uh, the, our, 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 it's not bearing good fruit. There's very few leaves on it. Why is it encumbering us? Why, why does it use up the ground? I could put more tomato plants there. <laughs> <laughs> The tomato plants are surrounding it, but it's it's not. I'll give it one more year. I'll dig and dung it. <laughs> and then maybe it'll bear fruit next year. But in the meantime, my tomatoes are going to be, I believe, trusting God, full of fruit. We are saved by grace through faith alone, but faith always is going to be bearing fruit. Now, here's a quote. Those are beautiful works. Beautiful works. They're works of love. I'm going to end on a quote from Luther about works. I found this this morning, and I said, I've got to put it in here. Hmm. It's a little long, <laughs> and the well, sentences are long. So let me read it, and then we'll, we'll dwell on it, and then we'll close today. For wherever the gospel is in the heart, in truth, it maketh a man and a person such that he or she does not wait until the law comes to him, but he is so full of gladness in Christ, he is carried forth into good works, and without any unwillingness, but with spontaneous freedom, does good unto all with, his, with all his power, before ever the law comes into his mind. Nay, he spends his body and whole life to do it, not at all regarding what he has to suffer. He is so full of good works that they flow, as it were, from a perpetual fountain and water many. Thus Christ would not even pick up a straw by compulsion, but where there was no compulsion, he offers himself to be affixed to the cross for me. and for the whole world, mm -hmm. and dies for the lost sheep. These, if I mistake not, may be called works. Mm -hmm. Think on that for a moment, guys. Think on that as we close today. There we are. Those <laughs> words of Luther that say, nice. go ahead, Pastor. It is by grace through faith in Christ. In Christ alone. Mm -hmm. Faith, but all, before it has ever picked up the book of the law, is so full of love to neighbor, to spouse, to friend, to stranger, to someone who works for the county, is <laughs> yeah. so full of love that says, you know, I'm going to make that person's day a little bit brighter when I call and ask for something by being cheerful. Someone said when you get on the phone before the person answers, smile. <laughs> Yeah. Just, just smile. It will, it will change your voice. When you call a bureaucrat, do not demand. Yeah. Even though you might have the right to demand. Here's how I do it. I was having a little trouble with your website, and 
maybe, maybe you could help me. Well, that involves that person in responding to love that may be in that person's heart instead of I have to do this. Here's some angry caller I have to deal with. I've had several of them this morning already, and I now have to deal with another one. It's my job. <laughs> so I come on with a little bit of charm, with a little bit of grace, with a little bit of pleading. Could you help me? It's a prayer. If you may allow me to use that word, it's a petition. And when you ask someone in your family to do something, though you might have the right to demand, go demand. Say, I wonder if you could help me. This ladder is a little heavy for me. I'm having trouble understanding how to wire this switch or to do that crochet stitch that you know how to do to make it special. I don't know how to do that. I'm trying to get into your worlds. Yeah. I don't know your worlds that well. Say you had a recipe the last time we got together. Would you, would you share that with me? I'd love to make that. You see what I mean? Your witness to your faith comes through in the way you lovingly ask. And I found out something about asking, that sometimes you can love people by asking them to do something. Because you give them an opportunity to show their faith by their works. And they're totally unaware of it. Yeah. You are, maybe. God is. And who else cares? You see what I mean? You can love by asking. If I ask, if I demand of you to read the scriptures, well, I could do that. But I'm pleading with you, asking you lovingly, as I do many times during the week. I did it a couple of times this week, sitting in a waiting room in an Im imaging center. I said to this woman, Read the Psalms. Read the Psalms. Mm -hmm. 150, take you five months, one a day. Read them. Yeah, it's going to help you. She didn't know I was a pastor. I didn't say it because I was a pastor. I did it because she was a, a helping person whose job it was to take people to imaging centers and to hospital appointments and to doctor's appointments and accompany them and translate for them. She was born in Brazil. And there's a, a work of love she was doing. She got paid for it, but she loved it. Mm. And I said to her, read the Psalms. Yeah. So that's what you can do as a disciple. I think we maybe have one more time together on the idea of discipleship. Okay. And, um, and then we'll, I'm working on something else. No. <laughs> you got something else. I have, I have total joy in this, you know, I don't have to <laughs> do this. Uh, thank you for joining and for praying. If you have prayer requests, don't hesitate to text me or to uh, give me an email. You have my email when I send you the invitation. Right. And if you want to keep it private, I'll do that. Lord God, you have joined with us in the Bible study to learn from you what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and we have much to learn, but we have been given so much. We ask you to bless the work of our minds and our spirits and our, the works of our hands and love toward one another. To be a disciple, not just in knowledge, but also in works of love, that you may bless us, each one of us, 
as we touch the lives of dozens of other people during our week. And whether we do it in person or by phone or on the internet of some kind, help mm -hmm. us to be graceful and loving. We ask it because of him who loved us and gave himself for us and died and bled and shed his wonderful, precious blood that we might mm -hmm. be forgiven all of our sins, even our failures to love. Hear us as we pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Amen.